Guys, being the president of MMORPGs is harder than I thought. It's not like being the president of the United States or the president of the United Kingdom. MMORPGs have real issues, like real-world trading, microtransactions, botting, power creep, dread. fast travel, new Existential skills, endgame crisis, content, new player experiences, the voices, oh god, the voices, the voices, the voices, get out of my head, get out of my head, get out of my head! Then quests. Listen, I've been playing MMOs almost exclusively for over two decades, so I'm just as jaded about MMO quests as the average bear. But after wasting far too much time playing Baldur's Gate 3 lately, going back to MMOs felt like jumping in an ice bath after being in a relaxing hot tub with Karlak. And that's a shame since quests are so important to the MMO experience. They can help guide new players and experienced players through the world, introducing them to key NPCs and storylines and helping them learn their abilities. But too often, quests are just used to pad the amount of time you have to spend playing an MMORPG without adding too much extra dev work. But that's not the case with every MMO. That's right, some MMORPGs are good and I'm not afraid to say it. So as president, I have made it my primary objective to play every single MMO that has ever been made to figure out which quests are good and which quests are bad. I don't have time to play every single MMO RPG ever made. How many can I, how many can I play? So as president, I played four MMOs to figure out what makes quests good and what makes quests bad. I specifically chose four MMOs that approach quests very differently from one another. And by breaking down quests into three key categories, we can hopefully figure out how to prevent more companies from making terrible frickin' MMOs! I'm sorry for cursing, that was unprofessional. Uh, but you know what is professional? Getting an education. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'm wearing glasses, because I'm pretty smart. And you could be smart too, thanks to today's sponsor, Southern New Hampshire University. SNHU has an extremely large selection of online degree programs. The one that interests me the most, and likely you, is game dev. You know, because when you're playing a new MMORPG these days, and you're like, do these guys know how to make a game? They probably didn't go to SNHU. In the Game Dev program, you'll learn everything you need to know to make a good game. Everything from 3D modeling and texturing, AI, programming from C Sharp to C++ to Java, which is especially good because that means you'll have a fundamental basis to do anything else you might want to do. What I think is really cool is that these Game Dev programs are taught by people who have been in the industry, which is a pretty rare opportunity. So that must mean that it's super expensive. Wrong, actually. SNHU is radically affordable. It actually has one of the lowest tuition rates of any online university. So if you want to learn more, you can click the link in the description or go to snhu.edu slash idle. And there you can learn more, like the average salary for a programmer, or you can even talk to a real person to get more information about the program. So again, to learn more, click the link down below, and thank you to SNHU for sponsoring this video. Now back to me being stupid idle. I also want to thank my lovely Patreon supporters, or as I like to call them, the voters. There's a link in the description if you'd like to support. Thanks. Listen, I'm a nerd, okay? I love lore. I can tell you so much about the RuneScape lore, and when I started playing WoW Classic, I watched every novel, um, noble, no, Nobel? 87 video on Warcraft lore. So if a quest or questline wants to impress me, it's gonna have to kinda go insano style with the story. The MMOs I played can be basically split into two categories. Main questline and vibes. Final Fantasy XIV and Star Wars The Old Republic have well-defined main stories based on whatever starting options you choose. It should surprise no one that these are the two MMOs with the most defined storylines. After all, they're made by Bioware and Square Enix, two companies known very well for their narrative-driven RPGs. I especially grew up obsessed with the single-player Knights of the Old Republic. I played that game to completion easily over a dozen times. Something about it just kept me coming back. <laughs> So an MMORPG set in the same universe, also made by Bioware. Yeah, I'm gonna wanna play that. If I can remember anything about those games, it's that character creation is extremely important, so I need to make sure I nail the character creation process in both of these games so I can get the best possible experience. Obviously, in Star Wars, it only made sense to go Sith, because inside every man there are two wolves, and both of my wolves listen to Machine Gun Kelly and abuse their wives. I can't... 
I can't say that. So the Sith bounty hunter Baldul was born. I accidentally gave myself super rosy cheeks though, so that kind of takes away from my intimidating persona. For Final Fantasy XIV, I heard some pretty loud feedback about the first character I ever created back in this video, which you should watch. So I made sure to take all of your constructive criticism into account. Now I just have to pick the right name and boom, a lovely young marauder. Star Wars The Old Republic has a familiar morality and dialogue option system from other Bioware games. And since Baldur's only goal in life is to maximize profit, this makes it really easy for me to immerse myself in the game. It's pretty epic role playing. You don't understand. We start off by getting introduced to my main man, Barton, and I love this guy. So if anything happens to him, I'm gonna be real upset. Every single quest I did in this game was fully voice acted, including my character and including the side quests. And the voice acting is really good good. It makes it really easy to immerse yourself in the game without having to go back to reference a clunky quest log or anything like that. You kind of just internalize what's being said to you. And I mean, just listen to my character's one-liners. They're pretty awesome. I hope you had to kill a lot of Fothra's thugs to get this. And I enjoyed every minute of it. I think it's blasting time. Pizza time. The main questline quests are highlighted in purple in your quest log and quest tractor, which makes it really easy to focus on the main quest line if that's what you want to do. Final Fantasy XIV uses the same system by having the main quests use this more ornate quest icon. There's no voice acting for most of the quests until there is. <laughs> Thus reads the sailor's requiem carved into yonder stone. I would understand if only the main quests were voice acted or if none of the quests were voice acted, but only having parts of the main quest voice acted, it just felt a little weird. The story itself though is really interesting. You get a big cutscene right after character creation to walk you through everything that's happened in this world. You know, like the destruction of civilization at the hands of a dragon who is known as the Dragon King, seeing countless lives lost in an event known as the Calamity. Luckily, with your character's arrival, you can now do important things that will have nearly as big of an impact on the world, like breaking rocks. The main storyline in Limsa where, <clears throat> Busty Idol started her adventure revolves around a gang of blue tattooed pirates. The build up to finding these guys is long and some of the quests along the way are definitely a little... Uh. But when I started to sink my teeth into the story, I really started to enjoy it. The whole debacle centers around this guy named Severin, who is a reformed pirate turned farmer who's a little busy doing crimes instead of doing his job. But we've all been there, am I right, ladies? Eventually, after doing a bunch of more random farm tasks, Severin gets caught by the blue tattooed pirates who he was trying to sell his friends to, and you go save his life with this cat lady who you helped earlier. After a lot more just running around and talking to people, you defend a ship from a pirate attack, and... Uh, listen, this story is cool and all that, but it's just flooded with fluff and tedium that just really takes away from it feeling like a main quest line. I get that I need to level up to progress my way through the main storyline, but I don't think that needs to be done through quests in the main storyline. It's okay if I do a main storyline quest and then I need to go grind some side quests to continue with the main storyline. It'd just be great if the main storyline focused on plot progression instead of only doing that once every handful of quests. It reminds me of Dragon Ball Z where they would travel for six episodes in between the episodes that actually advanced the plot and mattered. I'm kidding of course, I've never watched Dragon Ball Z, I'm not a nerd. <clears throat> anyway, back to obsessing over MMORPGs. I personally think that Star Wars does a much better job with the pacing of their main quest line and balancing it with the side quests. First of all, with almost every quest, you have choices. Just like in the old Knights of the Old Republic games, you can make decisions that align you with the dark side or light side. But this choice isn't just limited to what you say at the start of quests. You can get these options to change the ending of quests too. For example, this guy wanted me to go get his brother out of jail. When I got to the jail though, the guard offered me a little extra money to leave him there and tell the quest giver I just got there too late. And that's like totally of my character, look at him. That's totally something that guy would do. That means the side quests you have to grind sometimes to progress with the main quest line don't feel as linear or as boring as breaking rocks. I just, I guess I just don't know why I had to break the rocks. It can go even further than that though. There's a quest where you have a bounty to find and kill an accountant for a rival gang. After blasting your way through the stronghold and finding the accountant, he offers to transfer you a bunch of the rival gang's credits to spare his life. Obviously, being a businessman, I took the extra credits from this man's bribe. And then I killed him and collected his bounty anyway. 
It's so sick that I had the option to both get the extra money and still finish the job. That was just... It's overall just a nice touch to allow me to have real influence on the minor parts of the story. The main story for bounty hunters, and as I understand it, every class has a very different main story, is all about endearing yourself to this handsome fellow to get yourself into the great hunt. Along the way, you'll have to sabotage, kill, steal, and do a lot of other bounty huntery things to get in the good graces of this hut. It's really cool and it sounds like it might just be repetitive, but each bounty is unique enough to make it feel like I'm doing something different even if I'm not really. I can remember almost every bounty I did without going back to my notes and that's saying something. And while we're at it, I have a quest for you. Subscribe uh, and like the video. And if you do that, the reward will be 100 gold. Old School RuneScape and WoW Classic, on the other hand, do quests completely differently. There's no main storyline you're trying to advance, you're just going off vibes, baby. There's no world-shattering narratives in these games, not really, at least. If you want to skip a major quest line that reveals who's been running a gang of criminal terrorists, is criminal terrorists redundant? You can totally skip that quest line. It doesn't matter. The other quests around the world will remain mostly the same. But this does mean that the story can kind of go by the wayside. Take WoW Classic, for example. I'll skip over some of the lower level quests since they just have you do things like uniting lovers from feuding families or retrieving a lost necklace and other minor things. Quests that are important to making towns feel alive and giving the player things to do, but not exactly engaging stories. For the Alliance, the first quest line you'll get that really starts to pull you into the world is the Defias Brotherhood quest line. This starts in a region called Westfall, but will take you to many different cities and towns before it ultimately leads you to the first first dungeon many people will face in their WoW Classic journeys, the Dead Mines. This story is really cool and has you arguably fighting for the bad guys. I'll give you the short version, but basically, the human capital of Stormwind was destroyed by the Horde some years ago and was rebuilt by a group called the Stonemasons, who the leaders of Stormwind were like, hey, thanks for rebuilding. We're not going to pay you, though. The Stonemasons were, for some reason, mad about that, so they became the Defias Brotherhood and decided to do terrorism. They're led by this guy, Edwin Van Cleef, and your job as the players to gather a group of other adventurers, go into the dead mines where he's residing, and take him out. This is a really cool story because there's no good guys in this situation. You're fighting for people who wronged the working class, but Van Cleef and the Defias Brotherhood have decimated the farms and taken the lives of many innocent people. The real problem with WoW Classics quest stories is the way they're presented. Every quest starts with a wall of text that you click accept on, and that's all the context you're gonna get for the quest. Sure, you might read them at first, but when 99% of them don't say anything interesting, there's a really good chance you're just gonna not read it, click accept, and then do whatever the quest tracker tells you to do. So even though the story might be great, and in my opinion it is, most people are not going to be reading the story they're just gonna be doing the quests. Basically, it makes every quest feel like a list of chores rather than something you're doing in the pursuit of a greater narrative goal. Greater narrative goal. God, I sound like such a nerd right now, ugh. But presentation is exactly what helps Old School RuneScape get its story across. To start off, Old School RuneScape does its quest completely differently than any other MMORPG does. There aren't a bunch of small quests scattered around the world that might chain together to a bigger quest line. Old School RuneScape's quests are just generally chunkier. There's more story and more tasks within a single quest. Also, there's literally no kill a monster X times quest. You know, the kind of quest that's a complete staple of the MMORPG genre. No, Old School RuneScape decided those kind of quests are lame and they're too cool for those quests. So instead they made a whole skill that is entirely that, and for some reason, it's like everyone's favorite skill. So just like World of Warcraft, RuneScape has all of the same pretty boring lower level quests, like Cook's Assistant, where you get the ingredients for a cake. You don't make the cake, you just get the ingredients. So 
but you get your first real taste of what RuneScape quests are like from Dragon Slayer 1, a quest released all the way back in 2001. It's a pretty easy free-to-play quest. It's meant to cap off the free-to-play experience by combining everything a player would have learned while traversing the land they have available to them. You have to kill a dragon residing on an island it had destroyed many years ago. You go on this quest to find clues as to how to kill the dragon and finding the pieces of the map to navigate to the island. It's not the best story, but it's decently interesting, especially considering when it came out. I think what really benefits RuneScape's storytelling, though, is the way the chat box is set up. RuneScape can only fit so much text per chat box frame, which makes it a lot less intimidating to read. There's also dialogue options with most NPCs during quests that don't actually do anything, but it's just a bit more engagement for the player. Basically, you're not just thrown a wall of text to accept. You're offered a chance to read through and then interact with the quest giver and following quest NPCs. RuneScape's quests started getting longer and more narratively driven the older the game got, culminating in quests that come out recently like Dragon Slayer 2, Desert Treasure, 2, Song of the Elves. I mean, I just want to highlight Desert Treasure 2, one of the most recent quests to come out in Old School RuneScape. It tells one of the best stories Old School and, I think, an MMO has ever told. I didn't look at any walkthroughs and I was personally engaged with it the whole way through. But if you ask the average RuneScape player what they think about quests, they're not going to give you the gushing response that I'm giving you right now. And that's because the majority of players don't care about the story. They care about the process, and the process is kind of stinky. Old School RuneScape's quests until about two years ago were kind of known for being complicated and gross and confusing. They were designed in a way where it didn't make solving the puzzles satisfying, it made solving the puzzles without a guide just annoying. There would be these random item requirements that you would have no way of knowing about until literally it told you, whoops, looks like you don't have a hammer. Better go grab one from the bank, which is 800 miles away from here. Like, you were literally punished for not just looking it up ahead of time. That's why all the way back in 2002, we started to get websites like tip.it and runehq, which gave not only the list of items you would require to do a quest, but also a complete breakdown of how to do the quest. Fast forward to today and you have everyone using a plugin called Quest Helper, which just highlights and points arrows at whatever you need to click on to do the quest, including chat options to do the quest the fastest way. Like, Quest Helper just turns quests into a couple of brainless hours so you can unlock a piece of content. All this came about because the quest design was just that bad. But just like how Old School RuneScape's stories have gotten much better recently, their quest design has gotten significantly better recently as well. The quests that come out now are well designed to be solved without a guide. I actually think a lot of them are more satisfying to do without a guide. But there's still over 150 quests that are badly designed, and it's kind of hard to convince people to do them. WoW Classic suffers from a really similar issue despite the fact that the quests could not be more different from old school RuneScape. Since basically the release of World of Warcraft, players have used an add-on to help them find where quest objectives and quest start locations are. That's because WoW Classic has no indication of these anywhere on the map. When I started playing, I didn't know about these add-ons, so I had to go off the vague descriptions the quest givers give you to find out where my quest was supposed to be taking place. But the reliance on quest helpers is where the similarities with old school RuneScape's quests end. Wild Classic quests are exactly what you think about when you imagine MMORPG quests. They're your classic kill X monsters, or collect Y of thing, or deliver this letter to this person type quests. They're about as standard as you could possibly imagine. The only thing that changes is the context around the quests. Like needing to kill kobolds to get gold dust, or needing to kill murlocs for an apothecary or killing wolves to protect some people. But to their credit, sometimes the quests are genuinely challenging and interesting. Usually this comes in the form of quests that require you to kill a single target. One of the most iconic low-level quests in WoW Classic is one that has you kill a big bad knoll named Hogger. <laughs> in official hardcore and regular WoW Classic servers, you'd most likely group up to do this quest. Honestly, there's a good chance you're gonna group up to do a lot of quests. And that's kind of my favorite part about questing in World of Warcraft. I love either questing with friends or finding a random group who happens to be doing the same thing as me and helping each other out. It makes the game feel like a, oh God, like a massive multiplayer uh, RPG 
that's also online. Man, they should come up with a term for that. No other game I played had the same amount of opportunities to group up with others during questing. Now this could be due to the popularity of WoW Classic versus say Star Wars The Old Republic, but I think it's actually the layout and flow of the quests that is really conducive to this experience. The placement of quest givers and quest objectives in WoW is just really well thought out and really intentional. It leads to a lot of different players, even if they're playing different races, finding themselves in the same area and encouraging them to grow group up to finish these quests slightly faster or to do quests that are slightly out of their level range. Basically, it implicitly makes grouping a beneficial thing to do without forcing you to group, which is really cool. But as far as the actual quests themselves are designed and their objectives, yeah, they're, they're kind of boring. <laughs> Remember how I mentioned the Defy's Brotherhood quest line that would send you into your first dungeon, the Dead Mines? Well, there's some other quests you're going to complete while in that dungeon, and one of them requires you to get 10 red silk bandanas from the Defy's Brotherhood members. But this quest is actually a follow-up to a quest that had you get 15 red leather bandanas in the same questing zone from other Defy's members. But that quest was actually a follow-up to this quest that had you get 6 red linen bandanas from Defy's members. And that quest was actually a follow-up to this quest quest in the starting zone that had you get 12 red burlap bandanas from the Defias members. And that's where that chain adds wrong! It actually continues in another dungeon where you have to get 10 red wool bandanas from Devias prisoners! You see what I mean when I say that like a lot of the quests are the same? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's that. So it might sound like I kind of hate the quests in WoW Classic, and for some reason I don't. <laughs> There's just something about the process of questing that gives me just enough dopamine to continue enjoying it and just kind of turns my brain off. It turns playing World of Warcraft into kind of a comfy, cozy experience. But my brain does not feel the same way about the Final Fantasy XIV quests. Final Fantasy XIV's quests are extremely similar to World of Warcraft Classics quests. You know, delivery quests, kill quests, the whole enchilada. But doing these quests was not comfy cozy. It was uncomfy and uncozy. I think the reason for this comes from the flow of quest objectives. Final Fantasy XIV feels so much more disjointed when questing around the world than World of Warcraft. Take the Marauder's Guild questline that I was very excited to complete. I mean, in my notes, I even wrote that I was horny to join the Marauder's Guild. I don't know what mental illnesses I have, but... I know I have a lot of them. This questline constantly had me leaving the Marauders Guild, which is tucked away in the north of town to go just outside the gates to kill three of a brand of monster. And then I had to go all the way back to the Marauders Guild. Even with the Aethernet fast travel system, this still felt really annoying. Like I actually wish they just had me kill more monsters or put a Marauders Guild quest giver outside the city gates for some reason. Anything to reduce the downtime between me actively doing the quest and me running around to turn it in. Another thing that really hinders the questing experience is there's no real payoff. Take this quest chain, for example, where I find out a criminal has been spotted around the town's markets. I get an eyewitness to draw me a portrait of the criminal, which I then take to the police. I'm expecting this all to culminate in me getting to take down this bad guy with my awesome giant axe, but instead the police just say, Oh man, this drawing sucks. You need to get the witness to come in for questioning. And I'm like, oh, all right, I'll do that. So I go get the witness and they go in for questioning, but that's it. That's the end of the quest line. I guess they'll handle it. I mean, hey, shout out for having a good police system. There's actually one thing though that I really liked about Final Fantasy XIV's quests. There's one quest in the main storyline where this guy won't give me the quest until I'm geared head to toe in level five gear minimum. This was such a sick prerequisite because I was broke and I could not afford better gear. So I now had a real motivating factor to go and do side quests to either get gear rewards or get money rewards that would help me buy this level five gear. This was just an extremely cool near term goal and it made it super motivating to just go around the world and keep exploring. Even if I didn't particularly love the side quests. Oh god, why am I breaking rocks again? Yeah, so uh, anyway, I think that covers the quest processes from the MMOs I played. Wait, what about Star Wars? Star Wars? Star Wars? The uh, Old Republic? The uh, other MMO you played? Mm, no. You've literally talked about it multiple times this video. Oh, Star Wars, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Those quests and uh, yeah, those bounties. Yeah, those were, yeah, those were fun.
Yeah. Okay, so why won't you talk about it more? It's just, it kind of felt like an RPG. Yeah, an MMO RPG. No, I mean like an RPG that's online. Yeah, you lost me. With the Old Republic, there was hardly any opportunity or incentive to group with other players. I mean, yeah, I could literally invite people to my party and even have them tag along for the main quest, but from what I gathered, that's not really what happens that much. And the quests are super personal anyway, based mostly off of the decisions I, as my character, make. And the quest already gave me a companion after Barton died. Barton died? Oh, I'm gonna be sick. Oh my god. No, 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 no. Barton, it's all my fault. I'm sorry, Barton. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Please. Take me instead. Please. I'll never forget you, Barton. And I will avenge your death. Wait, his name was Brayden? Huh. I actually think the quests would suffer with any more people added to the equation. I mean, my health never even got close to zero. I was happy if I ever saw my health drop a hundred points. The quests were just really easy to do. Even the bounties that were like the big bad of that part of the story, I usually had no problem with it, even if I took on like 10 NPCs at once. Even when it came time to do my first heroic quest, which just means it's meant to be completed by more than one person, I didn't struggle much at all to solo it, but I actually only soloed it because free players aren't allowed to talk. And to be honest, I didn't want to pay $15 for the right to talk, so... Uh... I guess my point with Star Wars is, the quests are fun. They're too easy, but they're fun. It just didn't feel like I was playing an MMO. But one thing Star Wars did nail is the rewards. I mean, just look at this guy. Tell me he isn't the god of like, sex. And, uh, and murder. Oh my god, he's so hot. And then the game tried to give me this stupid helmet and they said it was an upgrade. An upgrade to what? Never having sex again? Yeah, then maybe. Uh, <laughs> no thanks. I don't think so. Sex God Goggle Man is my new persona and if you don't like it, you can get in line for the beatdown. So quest rewards. I mean, what's the point of quests if you don't get sick ass rewards for completing them? There's no point. There's no point at all. I mean, yeah, telling a cool story and all that is cool, I guess, but I'm not gonna care about your story if you don't give me a treat for being a brave little boy and going through your whole quest and killing the big bad muscly man or woman at the end of it. Star Wars The Old Republic dishes out rewards in the form of gear upgrades and buttloads of XP. But I'm gonna be honest, the quest rewards didn't feel that great in this game. You basically know that every main quest line reward is going to give you a direct gear upgrade because it's, you know, designed for your class. And the experience you get is cool, but experience doesn't really give me dopamine unless it gets me really close to a level up or gives me a level up. I think the real issue comes from the fact that if every quest is going to give me a gear upgrade, then no quest reward feels special and gives me that dopamine rush I'm looking for. It's made especially uninteresting by the way that Star Wars The Old Republic shows you gear upgrades. It really leaves little to no decision making for the player. Gear upgrades are indicated with a green arrow. If it has a green arrow on the icon, it's better than what you're using. Simple as that. You don't even need to read the stats, you just need to look for the green arrow. Very helpful for me considering I'm illiterate, but I imagine some of you out there wouldn't really be fond of that system. I think another point that has the quest reward system suffering is the lack of reward choices. A lot of MMOs when you complete a quest will have you choose one out of a handful of rewards. Maybe taking a staff if you're a mage or chainmail chest armor for warriors for example. There's very little of that, if any, in Star Wars The Old Republic. Okay, I mean. To be fair, there are a couple of quests where you get to choose the reward, like in this one, where you get to choose a new haircut for your companion. Or this one, where you get to choose a new outfit for your companion. So, you know, 
But I don't think quest reward choices are necessary for rewards to be satisfying. Look at Old School RuneScape, which has basically no quest reward selection. First off, RuneScape is completely different to both World of Warcraft and Star Wars The Old Republic, because you don't have one singular level you're raising. You have 23, 24 if you include combat level, which is just a calculation of combat skills. The main draw of quest rewards and the thing a player looks forward to in RuneScape usually is the experience, at least for low level players which is very different to most MMOs. But as the quests get more advanced and the storylines progress deeper, quest rewards become much more varied and interesting. I mean, finishing Song of the Elves and Sins of the Father gives you access to two massive cities which are full of game-changing minigames, skill training methods, and items. One of the best items you can get right now is a bow that you get from a boss inside the elf city. So you do need a quest to unlock it, but the quest itself doesn't give you this item. I think that's a really cool way of making the quest reward valuable, but not making it directly overpowered. But sometimes quests will give you a really powerful weapon, like Beneath Cursed Sands gives you a weapon called a Karis Partisan, which is really good against a certain type of monster, but the main appeal is getting a reward from a raid that upgrades this weapon to make it really powerful in different situations. So the quest rewards are pretty straightforward, but they're also multi-dimensional, and they serve as extra motivation for new players, because once you finish a quest, you have a really good idea about what you could go for next. Also, old school RuneScape has quest points. There are a little treat, and no one understands them. Are quest points based on how difficult the quest was? No. A novice level quest will give you five quest points sometimes, and a master level quest might just give you two. Are quest points useful? Not really. Sometimes quests require you to have a certain amount of quest points, but it's not that big of a deal. Again, it's just kind of our thing. We just, we have them and we don't want them to go. World of Warcraft Classic and Final Fantasy XIV treat quest rewards differently than the other two games. Usually you'll get an option between a set of rewards where you get to pick one. And this is a system that I personally love and I think it works really well in both games, but for different reasons. In World of Warcraft, a game where you're locked to your class throughout your character's playthrough, it's pretty rare to have multiple rewards from a single quest that are equally enticing. It's much more common that each reward makes the most sense for a type of class, like a cloth reward for spellcasters, mail armor for heavy armor users, etc. But this doesn't mean the quest rewards aren't still a very cool part of the game. Since the same quest can be highly appealing to multiple different classes, the encouraging of group questing is still very much there. If I'm playing my paladin and my friend is playing a mage, we'll both get a lot of value from completing the hog request, even though we'll end up picking completely different rewards from one another. I think Blizzard, before they were sexually assaulting people, really did a good job of making the most out of their quests while accepting that they weren't really going to be these huge earth-shattering stories most of the time. They placed them in the perfect areas to chain them together, the flow just feels right, and it does the perfect amount of pushing social gameplay in an MMO without punishing those who are leveling solo. It's why so many enjoy just putting on some relaxing music or watching YouTube while doing some one classic questing. It's a vibe, and it was designed to be that way. And if you're watching this while WoW Classic questing, focus on me! Stop focusing on that quest! Stop that! Stop killing that thing! Watch me! <laughs> With Final Fantasy XIV, the quest reward option system makes a lot more intuitive sense. You're not locked into your class or job in Final Fantasy XIV. Very early on, you can do some quests to unlock the other job types. So throughout your journey, you'll be collecting the best gear you can for whatever jobs you enjoy the most. This means that quest rewards can be used to fill in the gaps in your job gear, or you can just take the extra money, which is usually an option. It makes quest rewards a really satisfying system because there's a very good chance you'll get a dopamine rush from whatever reward you end up getting. There's one more important thing that World of Warcraft and Final Fantasy do that Star Wars and RuneScape don't. You get to know what reward you'll receive when you accept the quest. When I first saw this mechanic, I wasn't a fan of it personally. I was just really fond of my experience in RuneScape where the quest reward would be a surprise until I completed the quest and then it was just a little extra fun when I finally finished the hours I invested. But the more I've played both ways, the more I've grown to like both systems a lot. I think RuneScape system works really well specifically for RuneScape because Quests are just a larger time investment, they're rarer, and there's no concept of abandoning quests. They're just always going to be there no matter what. And there's an incentive to finish every single quest. So getting that upfront information about what you're going to get out of a quest isn't nearly as important as in the other games. In these other MMOs where there's way more quests scattered all around the world and there's not incentive to complete every single one, 
you might want that information to know if you want to go out of your way to do a quest. For example, if a quest requires you to go four towns over and you can see that it's going to reward you with three silver, yeah, maybe you're going to decide to abandon the quest or put it off for way later. But on the other hand, if you see a quest that has you go to a different continent but has a really great reward, then that's a motivating factor to go out of your way and do that quest and then even explore new lands. This upfront information is really important when there's so many more quests and it actually is a little bit fun to prioritize which quests you do and don't want to do. So in my opinion, one system isn't strictly better than the other. It just depends on the game and I think both are totally fine. And that's true for MMO quests as a whole. No one game is doing quests perfectly. Sure, Star Wars has a really great story and narrative, but it feels really single player and isolated. Old School RuneScape doesn't even have the concept of quest grouping, but the reward system is just so good that it doesn't really bother me. And while WoW Classic and Final Fantasy XIV have the classic kill X quests and delivery quests, they both appeal to a lot of people, including me sometimes. I think there's so much room for improvement with quests and MMOs, and I think the perfect system lies in combining what has worked in many previous MMOs and mixing and matching until you get just the right utopian solution that makes it so quests are the best part of MMOs and not the worst. But I don't know, I'm not a game designer. I, I, I just talk until I run out of things to say, which is right now. If you made it this far into the video, gross, what are you doing? Stop, go away. But why don't you comment something like, mamma mia, so that people will think that this video is a very spicy meatball. Making awesome jokes while stating my correct opinion would not be possible without the support of my patrons. If you'd like to support me on Patreon, you can do so with the link in the description. But I really just want to thank those who have been with me this far. Starting off with the members of my- ah! Tear. <laughs> My neighbors are gonna be so mad. John Sexum, Kunabazi, Huli, Suede Oxford, Joshi, a hobo with a spork, and Paradox. Thank you guys so much. I love you. If it wasn't for my executive milk producers, I would already be dead. Those people are, wait, never mind, Fantastic Penguin, Azalan, Loon Master, Charlie, Vinian, Siesta, Samurai Sussy, ooh, ooh, Mia IRL, Jepperite, K4S Silver, Omega Onion, Josh, Lift Fast, Sail Slow, Jamie Wright, and Light. Thank you all so much. I love you. And a last quick shout out to all of my milk producers. These are all beautiful people, except for this one. They don't really understand the ending of Lost? Kind of cringe. It's not that complicated. <laughs> Thank you again to all of my patrons, and I love all of you.